This week on The Communicators, a discussion on the issue of copyright and its challenges in the digital age with Mary Beth Peters of the Library of Congress. We're joined this week on The Communicators by Mary Beth Peters. She is with the Library of Congress and specifically serves as the U.S. Register of Copyrights. Our guest host for this program is Paul Sweeting, the editor-in-chief of ContentAgenda.com. To both of you, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Ms. Peters, uh, for, for those who may not know, when we talk about copyrights, how does the Library of Congress get involved? Um, the Library of Congress is, has been, in fact, the home of the United States Copyright Office for many, many years. Um, in the beginning, it was in the State Department and in the courts of the, um, in the district courts. Um, but the librarian saw a great way to build a collection, and he offered to take it all over, and Congress agreed that, yes, indeed, this was a great way to build a library and gave him, the librarian, in 1870, both the registration role and the deposit function for copyright. It's been there ever since. And I suppose in this day and age, plenty has changed since 1870 when it deals with copyrights. On a day-to-day -day basis, what are your main issues and what are the things you're faced with in this day and age? Um, the struggle for me as a lawyer and as someone who deals with policy are legislative issues and an issue with regard to digital technology and how that has changed perhaps um, the rights of authors and the exceptions that have been granted to, for example, libraries or educational institutions to see if, in fact, the balance is right. And there's a lot of legislative issues that we look at. There's studies that we do for Congress. Um, so there's always the policy issues, and that goes beyond our country to international issues and how they're playing out. But day in, day out, there are 500 people in the in the Copyright Office who register claims to copyright over one million a year and um, we have a new electronic system and so every day we worry about are we registering the claims correctly, what are the issues related to those claims, is the office functioning, are we getting in the money that we need, we have a licensing division that takes money in and gives money out under statutory licenses. So on any given day it could be any issue but it's never um, dull. To dive into some of the specific issues, sure. uh, Paul Sweeting. Uh, well, let's talk about one of those legislative issues that sure. you're dealing with. And uh, um, one of the issues your office has been uh, uh, heavily involved in, uh, as you know, is uh, orphan works. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, why don't you explain to us what exactly the issue is there? Okay. The issue is that if you want to use a work, a copyrighted work, for a productive use, for example, the Library of Congress that I work in, if in fact it wants to post photographs, or we had this issue, baseball cards, believe it or not, people are interested in baseball cards and they're protected by copyright. My mother and, made me throw mine out years ago. <laughs> Probably cost me a fortune. <laughs> um, then you really need, if in fact you are making a use that belongs to the copyright owner, if it's a reproduction, if it's a distribution, if it's a public performance or a display. Um, then you need to find that copyright owner and generally, unless it's fair use, um, get permission to do that activity. The copyright term today is very, very long. 95 years for yes. works and, for hire. And if in fact, if it's an individual author, it's the life of that author plus 70 years. So. Finding that author may be very difficult, and it's even more difficult with things like photographs and illustrations that don't have titles. And so I was the one who did the searching for the Library of Congress and tried to get permission and brought it to the attention of Congress that um, with a term as long as it is, with it, many works that are being protected by copyright, if copyright owners don't care about their use, or if you can't find them, that should not keep people from making productive uses. So maybe we should find a solution. Some countries have statutory licenses. We did a study at the request of Congress that basically said, we don't believe in a compulsory license. What we think we should do is encourage all copyright owners to make themselves known. But if, in fact, you do a diligent search to find the copyright owner and you can't, that should not preclude the use 
And then if the copyright owner comes forward, then they will be able to get money. It won't be an infringement. It would be the licensing price that you would have paid at the time that you sought to use the work. So it's a limitation on the remedy, but um, not an exception. So it isn't taking away anyone's right. If they're out there and you can find them, you deal with them. But if you can't find them, it does allow the use and then limits the remedy. There are, as you know um, now, um, at least two bills, uh, one in the House, one in the yes. Senate, um, that attempt to address yes. um, this issue. There are some notable differences between, yes. be between the two, um, some of which have become a s subject of some controversy. Yes. Um, first of all, what, what is your sense of the state of play of those bills? It seemed they were, a few months ago, they were moving very quickly. Now, perhaps, um, they've hit some rough spots on the Hill. Um, it's interesting. When we came out with our study um, and our recommended solution, most people were on board. As time has gone on, there have been more people who have found issues along the way. Um, there are differences. We actually favor the Senate bill. There are some issues, there are some provisions in the current House bill that if that's the bill that goes, we'll live with it, but the dark archive? The dark archive, exactly, the dark archive. Could you explain quickly okay. what the we dark archive is? We actually, um, our view is that the whole goal of the bill is to encourage productive use. And you shouldn't be putting obstacles in people's way in order to make productive use. A dark archive is that in order to avoid bad actors who may abuse the system, People who want to use the work should do their diligent search, their reasonably diligent search in accordance with best practices, which are still being fought about, um, and file their, a notice that they're using it and a summary of what they have done with the search with the Copyright Office. We would have to charge a fee for that service. There's a point where it would be kept dark unless, in fact, it was, in fact, being used and the issue was arisen, arises about whether or not a diligent search had been made and then you would dig up what had been filed. For me, um, I don't think filing with a government agency is necessarily the biggest benefit in the world. Num the, number two, um, ultimately a court is going to really decide on whether or not a person made a reasonably diligent search at the right time. And making this happen up front before the use and then having to pay a fee to the office to basically create a record of that document and keep that document and be able to produce it whenever it's needed is going to be expensive. And if you are something like the Library of Congress and you have 20,000 photographs and you have to do one of those for each and every one, I think it's an impediment to use. If that's what Congress decides should be done, of course, we will support it. But in principle, we prefer that not be in the bill. And wh what's your sense? Are, are we going to see a, a unified bill this year? Maybe not. Um, I was hopeful. Um, there are some holds on the bill in the Senate. We hear not because of issues in the bill but because of judicial nominations um, in the Senate. Um, on the House side, there are some live issues, and there is not agreement between the parties, and that includes illustrators and uh, textile manufacturers and photographers, um, copyright owners as a group, and then some of the nonprofit beneficiaries, like museums and archives. Mm -hmm. um, and anything is possible at this time, I would predict it doesn't look too positive. If that happens, we're ready to go um, next year um, and maybe limit it to nonprofit uses or, you know, a narrower bill. Um, but we'll see. I still believe in the principle. I hope someday, while I'm still registered, it gets there. Uh, another thing that has come up when libraries and things along that line, even in your office, I believe, is something about how digital rights management is used. Right. How has 
that changed what the library's ability or changed the library's ability to preserve works? At the moment, um, we have not seen evidence of the harm, but we believe that there may be issues for libraries. Um, we do a rulemaking every three years on whether or not there are particular uses of works that are legitimate uses that don't, do not infringe that cannot be achieved because of technological protection measures, and that would include digital rights management um, to some extent. Is there an example of that within a library? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, one of the issues with regard to preservation that could come up, up to date, it's really only come up with computer programs, which were um, games. And they were on a dedicated machine. So it wasn't on the um, content carrier, per se. It was on the equipment. Mm -hmm. And we did give an exemption for that. But for example, today, there are DVDs that have digital rights management and technological protection measures. And it's a do not copy. Now, we all know that there's a program out there that allows you to copy very freely. Um, Quite a number of them. But right now, that is not an issue because, at least for the Library of Congress, we would not choose a DVD to preserve. It would be the 35 millimeter print of the motion picture. Um, so it is an issue that will come up um, in other countries. Publishers and the National Library have worked out arrangements to get a um, digital rights management technological protection measure free copy um, for archival use. There is a report that was given to me recently by a study group looking at exemptions for libraries, and that was one of the issues with preservation and a suggestion that um, publishers should give libraries for who are equipped to do preservation, not any library, mm -hmm. but those who have the means to really preserve for posterity, um, kind of like rights-free um, copies, but those libraries, when they make use copies, must attach uh, reasonable um, protection measures um, to make sure that those copies that are in the clear are not circulating throughout the world. Just, just to back up one second, what about in the, in the case of uh, a DVD, for instance, where there is no 35 millimeter film? I mean, one of the issues I, that I think is going to become I agree. Uh, uh, more impo increasingly important right. is that content is going to be created in purely digital form. Absolutely. And the DVD may be the only archival, archivable um, that is element. correct. And um, then you would need um, if, uh, uh, an exception for the access control. Not for the copy of control, but for the access control. Um, and, and that may well happen. Um, we just haven't seen it yet. Um, but it's something that is on not just the libraries in the United States, but in all of the major, certainly developed countries in the world recognizing that more digital material is coming um, with technological protection measures and digital rights management. Now, one of the questions that I think is an open question is, this is what copyright owners are using to protect their works today. Uh, members of the public don't particularly like those choices. And ultimately, you it mean will... consumers, not the creators. Right, exactly, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and so consumers are not very happy with those. And whether or not those prevail in the years ahead, I don't know. Um, we'll see. Uh, but Go ahead. No, all I was basically saying is libraries in order to preserve, and I'm sure there's other issues with regard to institutions, um, will need a way to get a clean copy. And there are repositories. There actually are, like Portico um, is, deals with e-journals. And they get from publishers the material in the clear. When you think about private industries that enter into this field, like Google, a couple of years ago started a, a book archiving project working with libraries. What do you? How does that change, if it does, the playing field as far as the archival process is concerned? Well, I don't think Google's is really an archival um, venture. Google has a, uh, a goal to have a database that has every book in the world. 
and they did in fact work with the Library of Congress and we said you only could use public domain material. Um, they worked with some libraries who were not concerned about whether the work was under a copyright protection or not. But they're just scanning that material. They are not creating and what I would call preservation copies um, in the sense that preservation is more than just having a digital file. Um, but what Google is doing is trying to make sure, well, one thing is clear, that we know that users today, the younger generation, uh, does not like to go to a library. They want to get whatever they want to get on their computer, in their home, in their dorm, I don't know, out on a playing field, whatever. So that in order for works to have relevance to uh, generations for tomorrow, I think it does need to be in digital form. And in that sense, the more works that are digitized, whether it's Google or the British Library or Microsoft or Yahoo or anybody, that's a positive thing. Let's, um, let's talk some more about Google, um, changing subjects a little bit. Um, as you know, Google is the parent company of YouTube mm -hmm. and is currently embroiled um, in some you know, fairly monumental litigation, yes. um, Viacom, um, the English Premier League, and several other major copyright owners have, have sued uh, YouTube for infringement. I, I won't ask you to, to comment on the specific litigation, but um, uh, Go Google is claiming, as you know, that um, what YouTube does um, qualifies for the safe harbor the five, Section 512 Safe Harbor in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, and I guess the court is going to have to decide that question. Right. Do you feel that it, uh, the courts you know, can and, and should be left at this point to, to sort of define the practical limits of the safe harbor? Or do you think that there could be a need for, for Congress to step back in and provide more definition uh, as to what those <laughs> limits are? I think I'd like to see what what the courts do with the YouTube litigation before I, I say one way or the other. It is clear that when that safe harbor was created in 1998, 10 years ago, um, and it took a long time to get the parties to agree to what that should look like, um, there are four types of activities, and one is a mere conduit. Um, the question for Google is how active is it in what it does with the YouTube content. And I have read various sites, and I may have a, an idea of where the court may come out, but it really will be up to a court to kind of give more guidance on what does it take to be exempt and what kind of activities, if you do them as the service provider, um, make you more than a mere conduit. Um, so for me, I'm. I would be happy to have the courts set some guidelines. Now, the parties could settle because guidelines cut both ways. I mean, I mean, court decisions cut both ways, and so it, it's kind of a gamble on, you know, who would win and how detrimental that activity would be. Um, YouTube is extremely popular. YouTube, as Google even says, is a moneymaker. The advertising and things are really a good thing. I think what's come up uh, is filtering, and you see it in this country or other countries, whether or not filtering for infringing content should be part of um, a requirement in the safe harbor. Um, at some point, whether it's next year or two years from now, I think we will look at those safe harbor provisions, the Congress will look at those safe harbor provisions and say, do adjustments need to be made. And there are two camps. Some who think that they should be toughened up and made narrower, and others who think that they should be broadened. Um, but this whole issue of service provider, who's in the middle between the uploader and the downloader, um, is an issue that every country now is kind of struggling with. And you see reports coming out of Europe, some being tighter with their um, regime and some being looser, but um, I want to I want to wait to see what the court does 
um, and maybe there will be no court decision in the YouTube lit litigation. And even if there is, it, my guess is it'll go at least to the appellate level. At least. <laughs> If not higher. If what, not higher. How do you work with other countries then in, in making, because if they have each of, of them have a standard and compare it to ours, where is some common ground found? Well, what you're pointing out is that in the digital environment, borders um, kind of don't exist, and yet copyright laws exist within borders. So one of the goals always has been to harmonize laws so as content crosses borders, um, there's more similarities than differences. One area where there is no harmonization, and some countries even don't have the theory of secondary liability, um, there's primary li liability where I upload it and I'm the infringer if there's an infringement. And then there's the issue of what somebody does with that, the Internet service provider who may bring it to you, the dance hall that plays the music. Um, they're the secondary uh, people who can be held guilty for liability. That doctrine of secondary liability, holding somebody other than the actual doer liable, is not in every country in the world. Um, and so they have different rules. And that probably is one of the biggest area where, in fact, there are huge differences in countries, and you can't you know, generalize. And I know that on the international agenda, that's one thing that people, but they get very nervous when you start talking about this. Um, should there be educational symposiums? Should there be roundtable discussions on how countries handle this? And should all countries adopt a secondary liability regime? Uh, that is, go ahead. Is that something that you um, should be done for WIPO, do you think, or on a bilateral or multilateral basis? Um, it's been proposed for WIPO. Um, Which is? World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. I worked there for a while. Um, and it's a topic that doesn't have um, uniform or widespread um, support. Um, people see it as a plus. Others see it as a huge minus. Um, there's the developed world and there's the developing world and the newly industrialized countries. They don't all see it the same way. There will be a new director general in place the end of September, um, and it will be interesting to see how he sets the agenda for copyright. At that organization, there's been very little agreement on any uh, copyright issue. Um, I think the last treaty they were able to conclude was 1996. There's an argument being made amongst recording artists of what kind of compensation they could get, they should get, especially in the uh, digital media age. What position does the Library of Congress take? I will say, what does the Copyright Office take? Personally, um, performing artists, um, recording artists, um, they are as creative as any other um, uh, author, I think, in the copyright system. Um, in the recording area, because of the work made for hire doctrine in our country, um, they sell their soul when they do a recording contract. And lately, Congress has been stepping in and saying that when we create, for example, a statutory license, as we have done with regard to sound recordings and webcasting um, and some other digital services, the payment goes directly to the performing artist. It wouldn't go that way under their contracts with the recording companies. Um, so recording artists actually do need to be supported. They do need to continue to make a living. And I think the whole Internet digital environment is a way to uh, make them better known and have them come out better. Um, I think there are organizations that are fighting for their rights. Um, but it, it's an issue probably as much in this country as it is anywhere else because of our work made for higher doctrine. Is it, is it even relevant to, to talk about um, so-called parity between platforms? I mean, is, is radio, is, is this the statutory license um, system for radio an appropriate analogy um, for Internet broadcasting or uh, Streaming. Oh, that's a hot question. <laughs> uh, um, radio in this country is um, kind of anomalous. Uh, radio makes its money through advertising. And